welcome to class. <laughs> so, what did you notice? And hang on to those three words. I look forward to hearing them or reading them after class, of course. Um, I want to start by pointing out a couple of things that your subconscious might have noticed. First, that it didn't start with me, it started with you. Granted, those were my words on the slides, but they were read in your voice with your cadence in your head. Second, you weren't asked to frame your three words from any given perspective. It could have been scientific, mathematical, or emotional, creative, artistic, and musical. You could have come from anywhere, and that is exactly where I want you to come from. I'm not here to talk about how this Rubens tube works, and the physics teacher in me hopes that I just disappointed most of you. <laughs> but I'm here to talk about education and what it could be. There are many things I want from my students, to be masters of content, to be able to focus and work through difficult problems, to be careful experimentalists, but most of all, I want their curiosity. I want them to come into class curious about that jump they built at the bottom of the sledding hill, we want to talk about the physics behind interstellar, which is crazy. <laughs> and also, though, I want them to be innately curious, to have curiosity live in their souls, to be curious enough to see this and want to know how it relates to their lives. Lesson plans need to leave a space for curiosity. They need to let students ask the questions and come up with their own problems instead of always being given them. Imagine a world where students come into class saying, I wondered this, instead of, is this going to be on the test? <laughs> Which happens a lot. <laughs> so let's take it up a notch. You ready? Immediately after undergrad, I started teaching in the US public school system. And many of you are familiar with its siloed nature. You go to math class taught by a math teacher, and the bell rings, and you go to art class taught by an art teacher, social studies class, you get the point. So it was great, I had fun, it was what I was familiar with, but after four years of hundreds of teenagers and math and physics classes, I thought, maybe there's more. So I went to grad school for physics, and of course I would go there and master my silo, and I was really proud of it, and I was fascinated by it. But while I was there, I started noticing a couple of things. I started noticing that these brilliant physicists were stymied or plateaued because of a lack of business knowledge or connections or with weak English or communication skills. And I thought, hmm, these big ideas stayed small with a lack of social context or without an outreach to the greater community and all of its resources. I realized very quickly that I needed to go visit these other silos and I needed for them to come visit me. Students need learning experiences across silos to be successful in our world. The paradigm of siloed education is already being challenged, with Finland, a proven leader in educational transformation, phasing out subjects by the year 2020. That is soon. Also, the magic that comes out of MIT Media Lab, with a self-proclaimed culture of anti-disciplinary nature. And also, smaller programs such as U of R's Quantitative Integrated Science Program, where they blend these silos together and create a thinking that goes beyond traditional scientific methodology. I'm saying we can actually have this happen easily now with the resources that we have because there's so much money pouring into education. <laughs> so <laughs> let me give you an example. Say you have a biology teacher who's just fascinated by crime thriller novels, who loves to talk about the plot and the moral compass of all of the characters involved, co-teaches with a biology teacher with a background in forensic science, who can mix up concoctions and dust for fingerprints with the characters. Both subjects will be raised to a whole different level just by that simple teaming. Another example would be a math lesson that goes and looks at, of course, the pattern nature and the roteness of mathematics, but looks and sees where it's represented in art or in nature. And now you got three teachers involved, and the students can actually see these teachings across the disciplines and get inspired to do the same themselves. You all just did a small exercise in this with the Rubens tube. 
Some of you noticed the science behind it. Some of you might have just been drawn to the music and the artistry of it. And some of you just probably thought, dude, I need that at my next party. We need <laughs> all of these. All of these observations and emotions need to come together to create this Optimus Prime of experiences. <laughs> I'm glad you got that reference. <laughs> this is Raphael School of Athens, completed in 1511. It's the representation of my educational utopia, although it's a little man heavy. So, <laughs> that's that. That's okay. But these great thinkers can come together, and I want you to notice that there's teaching and listening and perspective sharing and idea sharing all involved. And I'd like to think that if we can make this scene happen more for our young students and even for our community, like we're doing today, actually, that we could make a society that automatically, innately, and just naturally can see things from different perspectives and can make connections when defining solutions that will just make our world a really cool place to live. Thank you.